Let's pick up our study today in John chapter number 16. Jesus is on his way from the upper room to eventually the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the other side of the Temple Mount from the upper city, which is the wealthier part of Jerusalem, the western hill, where I suspect the upper room was located. It's only a matter of maybe 20 minutes to walk from anywhere on the western hill up to the Temple Mount. And Jesus, along the way, is conversing with his disciples about their need to trust him and to understand that he wants them to love one another and to love the people that are going to be the target of the gospel that they're going to be preaching soon. They do not understand all the ins and outs of how this is going to work just yet. Uh, They have been told by him on a couple of occasions already in this evening's talk that the Holy Spirit who has been working with them is actually going to come and indwell them now and that they will be guided by him in remembering everything he's already taught, plus providing extra information. Uh, This is all important for them to have in their ears tonight because really horrendous, scary things are about to happen uh, in the wee hours of the morning when Jesus will be arrested and mistreated, and then eventually he'll be turned over to the Roman authorities and condemned for crucifixion. So they need this pep talk to keep them from despairing uh, tomorrow in the daylight hours. John chapter number 16 I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Exactly what I was just saying. They need this to keep them from bottoming out with what's about to happen. Verse number two. They will put you out of the synagogues. Now, that's a reference to something that's going to happen once Jesus is ascended. Uh, Now, they have already been threatened with this. Uh, The word was put out by the Pharisees who controlled the synagogue system pretty much, that anyone that dared claim that Jesus was the Messiah was to be put out of the synagogue. Uh, So these guys will be declaring that exact same uh, reality. Jesus is the Christ. He is the resurrected Messiah. And so they're going to get kicked out. Continuing in verse 2, Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And the first apostle to die will be Judas, excuse me, will be James or Jacob, uh, the brother of John who's writing this gospel down. And uh, King Agrippa will think that he is helping the cause of Judaism when he does that. And of course, the Pharisees believe that the cause of Judaism is the cause of God. And then uh, King Agrippa will try to uh, kill a second apostle, and God will intervene on that particular one. Uh, So Jesus is warning them ahead of time about this sort of stuff. Verse 3, they will do these things, because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, he's already been talking about that, right? That Jesus represents the Father, and they're rejecting Jesus, therefore they're rejecting the Father. They're hating on Jesus, so they're hating on the Father. And Jesus says, they're going to persecute you, because you represent me, I represent the Father, and they don't know the Father, they don't know me, and so they don't really know you. Verse 4. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Now, I've shared with you before, part of the prophecy, purpose of prophecy, is to 
promote the identity of God, that he knows all things outside of the time stream. He is from the beginning to the end. He knows it all. But another purpose of prophecy is to help those that are going to have to go through a tough time to know how it's going to all end up and that they just need to trust God to get through it. And so that's part of what Jesus is telling them now is you guys need to know these things are about to happen so that when they do happen, you will know I wasn't caught off guard by them, that this has all been understood as part of the process that we have to go through to get to the end result of salvation. Now, they're still pretty scary. They're still very unsettling. And so Jesus testifies this next. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. So Jesus didn't start his... uh, work with the apostles by saying, oh, by the way, anybody that becomes an apostle, uh, you're going to have nothing but trouble in your future time, and most of you, you're going to be killed, uh, and even those of you that might die of old age, you're going to have a rough time up to that dying of old age. Uh, that would have been tough. That's a, that's a tough thing to know from the very beginning. Uh, plus, Jesus was right there with them, and so they needed they didn't need to worry about things then at the very beginning because he was there. Uh, he's going to be gone now physically from the scene, and they're going to have to go through these things alone or without his visible presence. And so he needs them to understand now, I'm not going to be here anymore to hold your hand. So you're going to need to trust the Holy Spirit. Verse number five, but now I'm going to him who sent me. That's the Father. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Now, I think we have in our English here a misunderstanding of the verbiage because they have literally asked him those words. Where are you going? Why can't we go with you? Um, how can we know the way to where you're going? So he's, they've actually asked those words. What Jesus is actually representing here is none of you can ask and understand the answer to that question because you don't understand what you're asking. You don't understand when I say I'm going to the Father that I'm talking about dying and rising again and ascending on high. You don't have your heads wrapped around that. So you can't really ask a question that you can't comprehend the answer to. But, verse 6, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So you understand at least that concept that I'm talking about leaving. And you're brokenhearted about it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, this is a hard sell. They don't like talking about him dying and going away. But Jesus says, you need to understand, unless I do this, you can't be benefited. Now, what's he mean by that? Unless he pays the penalty for sin, we can't move to the next phase of relationship with God, which is the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Uh, In uh, the Gospel of John, same book, chapter number 7, Jesus at the final Feast of Tabernacles that he goes to, he cries out on the last day about anyone that uh, is willing should come to him and he would... He would give them waters of life flowing out like this great big fountain. Uh, And then John adds the commentary that he was speaking not of literal water, but he was speaking of the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the point John was making then is the same point I'm trying to make now. And that is, until Jesus paid the price, 
the Holy Spirit could not indwell anyone. Remember, he's already told the apostles, the Holy Spirit has been with you, but now, hereafter, he's going to be in you. So Jesus is trying to soften the separation anxiety of the apostles regarding himself by reminding them, unless I do my part, which means going away as well, you can't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. So let's read it again with that kind of preparatory work. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is going to pay the price, then he's going to ascend on high, and then he is going to send the Holy Spirit as the indwelling gift, as the indwelling helper, the paraclete, the comforter, uh, the counselor, the one that's going to come alongside of us and help us do what we need to do and uh, provide the information we need to know uh, through the, the New Testament in particular, uh, the information we need to know about Jesus and the ministry that he's accomplished and which now has become our ministry, uh, the proclamation that he died so that we might live and that he loved the world in this fashion of dying so that they might not have to go to hell, that instead they could go and spend eternity with him. So that's the helper. That's the Holy Spirit ministry. And Jesus leaves after having paid the price so that the Holy Spirit can come in. Verse number eight. Here's the prophecy about the Holy Spirit. When he does come, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit's mission when he comes as the indwelling gift as the provider of the New Testament, inspired documents. When he comes, here's his mission. It's threefold. He is going to lay down the convicting information, the convicting evidence for the world to understand about sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, Jesus breaks it out for us. He says, concerning sin because they did not believe in me. Sin is the violation of relationship with God. It's not doing things God's way, doing things the opposite of God's way. And so it separates us from God. Well, Jesus came back to this planet, or came to this planet, in order to provide a way of coming back into right relationship with God to fix the sin problem. But when you don't believe in him, when you reject him, then you you stay in sin. And so the Holy Spirit, part of his job is to let you know that's the choice. Believe in Jesus, be saved from sin. Don't believe in Jesus, remain in your sin. Verse number 10 concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Now, part of the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to help all of us live the righteous life. See, Jesus Christ became the sin offering on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of him in this world. We've put him on as the robes of righteousness in our new life. And so the Holy Spirit is the one that's helping us do all of that because Jesus is not here physically right now. The Holy Spirit is. And so that's his job with believers. And then verse number 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, Satan is not yet condemned completely, 
but he has been judged by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had his power base broken because Satan is the accuser. Satan is the one that says bad things about people. He is the one that effectively is saying everybody else did what I did, which was reject God as my my God, the one that can tell me what to do. Everybody else did this, and so they need to be in the same condemned boat that I'm in. And uh, Jesus broke his power base by providing a way of salvation but not salvation for Satan. Satan and his angels remain under the condemnation for what they did. And so that is another thing that the Holy Spirit bears testimony to, is that Satan was defeated at the cross and the empty tomb, and he will be ultimately condemned to eternal hell once everything is wrapped up Uh, in the pages of the book of Revelation. Verse 12, now Jesus Jesus gets uh, intimate with them in in his, his time constraints, if you will. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So you can't handle everything that I really need to tell you about. So Jesus effectively turns all of that education over to the Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles. Verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, just like Jesus spoke the words of the Father, the Holy Spirit also speaks the words of the Father. So the inspiration of the Holy Spirit into the lives of the apostles and the prophets, which results into the books of the New Testament, all of that is God's word for us to know and live, and act upon. Some of it is prophetic in nature. That is, it speaks things ahead of time. Uh, I mentioned the book of Revelation just a moment ago. Uh, That book is the testimony of God the Father through Jesus the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and through his angels, and through John the Apostle, so that we can all understand how this is all going to get wrapped up. Uh, It is an important part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, here is also a key part of the Holy Spirit's ministry. Verse 14, He will glorify me. That is, He will hold me up for people to see. He'll promote me. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ with the apostles and by extension to us, so that we know more about how glorious Jesus is. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all one God, and yet God the Father is the overarching supervisor of everything that happens within the Godhead. God the Son, Jesus, is the one who actually took on flesh and lived the perfect human life, even though he was tempted just like every other human. And then having done that, he laid his life down as the atoning sacrifice for sin. That was the mission of the Son. And in the process, He gave us what the Father wanted us to know. Then the Holy Spirit comes along. Uh, Part of His mission throughout all of of, uh, history was to take what the Father and the Son wanted the world to know and provide it through prophets, through apostles, so that it could be written down 
so that it could be spoken out. And so everything that the Father and the Son has been promoting, now the Holy Spirit is passing on to the apostles to be passed on to us. It's the unbroken chain of inspiration. Verse 16, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And then, again, a little while, and you will see me. Now, we can understand that because we live after the resurrection. We know the testimony of Scripture. But for these guys, they don't get it. They don't understand how he's going to be dead for a bit and then back again. So, verse 17, some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while and you will not see me, and then again a little while and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. So there's this talking back and forth, crosstalk amongst the apostles as they're walking through the streets of Jerusalem in the wee hours of uh, Friday morning after the Last Supper, but before Jesus uh, takes them out to Gethsemane. What does he mean, a little while? What's he talking about? And so Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What do I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Truly, truly, amen, amen. Remember, that's the introduction of an important concrete truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will re- rejoice. And that's true. A whole bunch of people will be very excited that Jesus is being executed and that he's dead. But the apostles are going to cry their eyes out. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. That's a, that's a hint at the resurrection, which Jesus has already told them about, but they still can't quite get that. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has t- come. That is, she hurts. Those birth pains are nothing to be sneezed at. They hurt big time. But when she's delivered the baby, you know, once all the labor pains are finished and the baby's here, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So one moment, uh, a woman could be in all the horrible pain of childbirth, in that last bit of pushing and crying about it and feeling the pain, and then seconds later have the baby on her chest and smiling big time and talking about how great it is to have this lovely little child there in her bosom. That's what Jesus says. It's the bittersweet moment that I'm trying to prepare you for. Verse 22, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Uh, They will have joy unspeakable once they come to this realization that everything Jesus said happened. 